In this chapter, we're going to be going over chapter six, uh, selecting employees and making sure they're placed in jobs that are necessary, making sure that you're getting the right people on the bus. Now, the whole idea behind this, again, is making sure that you're getting the right people to do the jobs that are necessary for the organization to achieve its goals. One of the things that will happen is many companies will use an applicant tracking system. In other words, they're making sure that they're keeping track of all of the people that are that coming into the organization, the ones who are sending resumes, applications, things like that. When you think about the entire process, it starts with screening the applications and the resumes. One of the things that typically happens is uh, companies are going to be using computers and computer systems to kind of screen a lot of the resumes and applications that come in. And they do that basically by looking at uh, keywords that are used in the application and in the resumes. Once you get a, a selection of resumes and people that you might want to talk to, you may have testing and reviewing any kind of work samples to see if they can actually do the job. Depends on the job. For example, when I was applying at Johnson County Community College, I actually went through kind of a group interview and they had me actually present and teach a section uh, of uh, a class that I could possibly be doing. And so they were kind of looking at the work sample that I provided. You get interviews, you check references and backgrounds, not necessarily all that often, and then also making the selection. Now, when you think about the systems, the systems that you use need to make sure that you are able to run all the checks that are necessary, identify your applicants, and keep track of the various things that are necessary as far as the information that they've provided. For example, you may need to provide a, a, a curriculum vitae in academic type of world, uh, resumes, maybe uh, some work samples and things like that. And so they need to be able to track and keep all of that. You need to make sure that the system that you're using gives you practical value and keeps everything legal. Now, when you think about your entire process, one of the things you want to do is think about reliability. Anything that you're doing must be reliable. In other words, you don't get you get basically the same thing every time you do something. And so any kind of measurements need to be reliable. Um, they need to be accurate and they need to measure what it is that actually matters as far as the job is concerned. There's also in the selection process the idea of validity. In other words, anything that you do needs to be valid as far as um, you are measuring what you say that you are actually going to be measuring. Now, there are different ways of measuring validity, criterion, content, construct. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be getting that deep into the, basically the statistics that go along with it. Just remember that any time, particularly you, when you, whenever you use tests, any kind of testing, they must be shown and proven to be reliable and valid. Reliable, you get the same results every time. Valid, it measures what it says it's measuring. Anything that you're doing needs to be practical and provide utility. In other words, you're getting more from it than when you put into it. Whenever you're hiring, you need to make sure that you are doing things legally. So we've talked about some of the legal issues and some of the laws that come into play in the past. You have your civil rights acts, you have your age discrimination and employment, and all the various employment laws that are necessary to make sure that you, what you're doing is something that is um, legal. When you start thinking about the interviews and the questions that can and cannot be asked, anything that's asked needs to be related to doing the job. You cannot ask something that could be considered discriminatory based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, veteran status, and disability. So for example, you can ask, what is your name? Have you worked under a different name? You cannot ask, what is a maiden name? What's nationality? These can be considered discriminatory. Can you show proof of age? Will you need any kind of reasonable accommodation? You can't get into, do you have any disabilities? Things like that. What schools have you attended? 
but you cannot ask anything as far as that might be religious related. Can you meet the requirements of the work schedule? Not into, you can't get into things like what religious holidays do you observe? You can see some of the questions and in the book it has some of the various questions that can and cannot be asked. There's also websites out there that show some of the questions that can and cannot be asked. In interviewing, what I tend to prefer to do is make statements. So for example, this judge, instead of asking, can you meet the requirements of a work schedule? What I will do is ask, is say, this job requires weekend work, both Saturdays and Sundays. If this is a, if this is a problem for you, you may reconsider taking the job if it is offered. In other words, I'm not asking them what kind of uh, weekends they can or cannot ask. I'm just saying it, this requires weekend work. And so if they take the job and then they come back and say, well, I can't work Saturdays or something like that because of my religion, you can let them go because they basically lied to you as far as whether they could do the job or not. <clears throat> Now, one of the things, this is kind of an interesting thing. What do you think might be a, a permissible, legally, qu legally permissible question? Will child care demands affect your ability to get to work? Do you have a car? Job requires you to be here from eight to five. Do you have any disabilities? Which one do you think is one, the one that is legally permissible? If you said C, you're correct. The other three, A, B and D are not legally permissible because there could be a situation of discrimination that goes along with it. And one of the things to think about is your application. The application that an applicant fills out is a legal document. It is a hiring instrument. In other words, they're putting down information as far as their contact, their work experience, their education, and they, they are signing, say that this is True to, uh, to my knowledge. Resumes, on the other hand, are not hiring documents. Everybody sends in resumes. The thing is, people are not hired based on the resume. A resume is a marketing document. That's all it is. The application is a hiring instrument. That is a legally kept document in HR. Many times, people have a tendency to kind of, oh, maybe expand. On some of their background and things in resumes. You get a lot of incomplete and maybe uh, expanded information in resumes. It gives you an idea as far as some of the background that people have used all right, or they have in the past. You cannot use it strictly as your only hiring instrument. Now most organizations will ask for references. In other words, who are some folks who can vouch for what it is that you've done with your character, that sort of thing. You have to remember that many times people were going to choose people who will say things nice about them. Now, when it comes to checking references, many times companies will go back and they will, they will check with the references. Do you know this person? What is their work history? Things like that. Most times when companies check res references, the only information that they are going to get is this person worked here from this date to this date. Their starting salary was this. Their ending salary was this. That's all they're going to get. And the reason for that is because there's been a lot of lawsuits that go into defamation. In other words, people have asked, people, asked others for uh, references. Give me a reference. The person says, man, they were terrible. They just went in and they go off on what the person did. The person who was trying to be hired can go back against the company for defamation if it was not something that was totally true. Then you get into the background checks. In other words, making sure that people are who they say they are. All right. And any kind of criminal background checks. Now, many times, Background checks will be done for certain jobs and not for others. So, for example, my daughter, a police officer in Kansas City, Missouri, she had to have a criminal background check as far as what she had done in the past. I mean, think about it. If you have somebody who's, who's trying to get on as a cop, do they have any kind of criminal past? 
A lot of times also, depending upon the job, they may do a credit check. So for example, if you are applying for a job as a bank teller, chances are they're going to do a credit check. The reason is because you're handling money all the time. <clears throat> One of the things to think about is the idea of testing. Many times, anytime you use kind of a test of some sort, you have to make sure that it's reliable and valid. And there are different types of tests, aptitude, achievement tests, things like this. I remember many, many years ago when I was being hired for uh, a bank in Atlanta, I had to take a math test. Okay. Sometimes, they're, they're, today, many times, unless your job requires mathematics, you're not going to have to take a math test. If your job requires any kind of coding, or typing of some sort. You may need to take some sort of a keyboard or typing test. There may be physical ability tests. Can you lift X number of pounds? Things like this. Cognitive ability tests, all right? There are not too many today that are using cognitive ability tests. It depends, again, on the job. And any kind of test you use has to be shown statistically valid and reliable. There may be some work samples. So for example, um, when I was being hired at Johnson County, I had to provide a work sample as far as some of the syllabi that I created in the past, some of the uh, uh, tests that I provided in the past, and I actually had to present a class. It was kind of, kind of that assessment center type of thing where people are actually looking at what it is that I can actually do. Some companies might use personality inventories. That's a big question mark there because of the reliability and validity aspect as far as can the person do the job based on the various quote unquote traits. Then you have honesty tests and drug tests. For example, honesty tests and polygraph tests, in other words, lie detectors. Um, most companies won't use that. However, my daughter, the cop, had to have a polygraph before she was hired. Most times when it comes to drug tests, it's going to be primarily for things like people who are driving, um, driving trucks for a, a company or for an organization. For example, I've done work with various cities in Kansas and Missouri, and the people who are driving the trucks, the snow plows, the school buses, things like that have to be drug tested. Now, most times, many times, um, when you are applying for a job, they'll ask you to do a drug test. If they ask you to do a drug test, that probably means that you're going to be given an offer to work there. Medical exams, you have to be careful about what you're doing. It, again, it has to be job related. Now, when it comes to interviewing, there are different interviewing techniques. Non-directive interview, basically what that is, is you just sit down and talk with somebody, okay? In other words, the person who's interviewing you, they just sit down and shoot the breeze with you. They're trying to get an idea as far as who you are, what you do, that sort of thing. A structured interview is one where there's a list of questions and those same questions are asked of every single candidate. And what they're doing is they're comparing the answers to the various questions. Situational interview is basically saying, okay, here's a particular situation, what would you do? I am not a fan of that. And the reason is because I could tell you anything you wanted to hear. What I think are the best interviews are behavioral interviews and panel interviews. Behavioral interviews are basically where they're saying, here is a situation, okay? Now, tell me about a time when you did such and such. So for example, let's say that uh, you have a, a job that's taking, that, that does a lot of customer interaction. Tell me about a time when you had a, had a disgruntled customer. What was the situation? What did you do? And how did you handle it? In other words, it's asking for specific situations that a person has already done. With behavioral interviewing, the basis is past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. And so what you do is you identify what are the behaviors? What are the skills that we want people to do in this particular job? And you ask questions that gets into, have they done that type of behavior? Have they done that type of thing? A panel interview is when you have multiple people who are asking you questions at the same time. Now, many times what they'll do is they will take 
multiple interviews of people. So, for example, when I was going to work at Hallmark, I was living in Atlanta at the time. They flew me to Kansas City, and I went through 10 interviews in one day. And what they did after interviewing me, all those 10 people, they got together and talked about is here are the answers that we got. Uh, do I give this person a thumbs up or thumbs down? When I was being interviewed for a job at Marion Laboratories, I was actually brought back three different times, and each time I interviewed with several different people. And what they did was they got together, they compared their answers, and then gave me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Now, the advantages of interview is you're talking to the person face to face. You can get an idea as far as who they really are. The downside of it is, if someone has any kind of a bias against a minority or something like that, it could play into whether that person gets hired or not, and what that person who is doing the interviewing thinks of the interviewee. This is why it's very important to have multiple people interview a particular candidate, because what you're doing is you're getting multiple views, and it tends to reduce the bias that might come into this. When you're thinking about planning for the interviews, what you do is you step back and you think about what are the things that this position, this job, has to be able to do? And you develop your questions based on that. And again, I really prefer the behavioral questions. Here's some of the th skills that this job needs. Tell me about a time when you did X. What did you do? How did you handle it? When you start thinking about the various ways that people are selected, you could have the multiple hurdle or the compensatory model. So the multiple hurdle, you have uh, a series of things and at each level, different people are eliminated until there's one left. The compensatory model is everybody goes through the same stuff and they're graded A's, B's and C's, one, twos and threes and things like that. Whoever has the highest score wins, gets hired. When you are communicating your decision to hire the person, what will happen is you will send them a job offer. Now, the job offer will include information as far as what are the responsibilities, their work schedule, what they're going to be paid, when to start, and any other kind of relevant details as far as do they need to do a drug test, do they need to do uh, fill out X forms, things like that. And then also a deadline to, re to uh, respond, whether they're accepting or rejecting the offer. One of the things I found is offers are always um, negotiable. So for example, I've many times worked with folks who were trying to get hired and they get an offer. And when I've worked with them as far as negotiating the, uh, the offer, in other words, it comes in with a salary at X and I work with them to renegotiate that a little higher. Maybe one of the things that they do is renegotiate an extra week of vacation or something along those lines. So hiring decisions and the final offer can actually be negotiated. So those are some of the key points from the chapter. If you have questions, please give me a shout.